Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. We hope that it will encourage you as you seek to follow God and grow in your faith. If you would like to know more about our church, you can check us out at www.ritmangrace.org or feel free to email us at ritmangbc at aol.com. But for right now, let's get into today's message. So as I was trying to say, so there's this gentleman, very, very kind person. People really liked him. He was good to everybody, meek and mild-mannered. Some people probably would have interpreted that he was just basically milk toast. And one day when he was away and he was reflecting upon it, before he came home, he started thinking, you know, people just walk all over me all the time. And so he was tired of that. So he was going to make a change. So he came in. And he called his wife into the living room, and he said to her, from now on, I'm the boss around here. And this is the way it's going to be. When I come home, you're going to prepare a gourmet meal for me every time, and you're going to have the newspaper ready for me to dine on as you're getting things ready, and then I'm going to sit and eat with you and dine with you. And when that's done, you're going to draw the most wonderful warm bath for me. And do you know who's going to towel me off and comb my hair? She said, yeah, the mortician. (laughs) Yeah. I think there's some truth to that. But um, so we want to talk about another area today of our spiritual discipline and walk with Christ. I read recently that Senator um, Mark Hatfield had one time made a visit to Calcutta and he wanted to see the work that Mother Teresa was doing there. And so um, obviously the, the children that she was working with were children that had very grave illnesses and were probably not going to survive. And people were just sort of bringing them and I don't want to be crude, but dumping the kids on her. And she was expected to just help them live out the rest of their lives. And Senator Hatfield was just horrified by seeing what all was going on there. And he, when he got an audience with Mother Teresa and was talking to her, one of the questions he asked her was, with all the pain and suffering and death that you're dealing with, how do you know if you're successful? And her answer to that was, I'm not called to be successful, but to be faithful. You and I are not called to be big successes in the world, but we are called to be faithful in serving God and serving others as well. So we've been doing this series on uh, spiritual disciplines, and we've looked at several subjects. Uh, We started off with um, Pastor Clark sharing about Bible intake, and we were studying the Word of God, the importance, the value of that, the necessity of that. We also looked at prayer and how we have to have that fellowship with God, the connection um, with him. Also worship, and in that case, we looked at the corporate worship and the value of um, all of us coming together and just praising and worshiping God. Last week, uh, we talked a little bit about evangelism and how vital it is for you and I to be sharing our story, just the simplicity of the gospel. And so today, we wanna talk about service service, being servants. You might have picked some of that up as you were hearing Sam read from Matthew chapter 20. Uh, That's a theme we'll come back to. There seems to be, with these subjects and the three more that we are going to look at after today in this uh, series, there seems to be a common thread that just goes with each of them. And that's the area of humility. Humility. Uh, I was really impressed when I watched, uh, now I wrote this days before, but then I got an opportunity to watch the interview of today's uh, testimonies that uh, actually it's Joe and Jamie Zollinger, and they're serving right now downstairs with our young people. But uh, to see their interview that they did and recording, the thing that really hit me was Joe makes the observation in there that the one thing that really impacted him about serving was the humility 
that it brings. And so I thought, ah, I was right in observing that as well. Joe saw it also. <clears throat> so here's a question. Uh, it's one that everybody's probably heard, but most of us haven't heard it for a long time. And that's the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? I imagine little girls said nurses and boys said pastors or maybe a pastor who marries a nurse. That makes sense. Actually, probably nurses and teachers and things like that for girls and similar things or firemen or ball players or, you know, other great fun occupations that guys like to think about. <clears throat> but really more important question is what Jesus wants you to be when you grow up in him. What does he want you to be? Who are you becoming as you're growing in your life, in your walk, in your spiritual disciplines? So we're talking about a servant. I realized uh, several years ago that we could learn a lot from those who serve on cruise ships. <laughs> That was fascinating. Our, some of our family got to take one once a while ago. And really in the whole hospitality world, um, they are the ultimate servants. Of course, they have a pretty strong motivation. It's called money. And uh, they get paid well. When we were on that cruise, there was one gentleman who was from Serbia. Good place to be from. And um, he connected with us. And I learned from him that he had several children. I think he had six or eight kids. I don't remember how many back in Serbia. And he was working hard to, um, on cruise lines, one after the other. He kept going on. And he was earning money because he wanted to bring his family to the United States to live. That was his goal. So he was working hard at that. It was kind of fun because he connected. Our grandson, Kyle, was preschool at that time. And he connected with Kyle because he had a son the same age. And I'll never forget the one on a cruise, they have one meal where you supposedly dress up and, you know, shirt and tie kind of thing. And so we were there and Kyle was fidgeting because he was done eating and we hadn't finished. And, and this uh, servant from Serbia came over and he took Kyle and he sat on the floor with him for about a half hour and just played with him. And every time he saw us, he would come and play with Kyle. It was just interesting, his servant heart and what motivated him. For you and me, our motivation is to serve because Jesus Christ loves us. And that's our motivation to serve. And in the Gospel of Mark, it says this, that Jesus stated, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. His love for us is what drove him to the cross to die for us and to be a servant to us. Authentic servants don't worry about who gets the credit. All that we worry about is that Jesus Christ gets the glory. <clears throat> there was a uh, orchestra conductor guy named Leonard Bernstein, and he was in Philadelphia for quite a few years. Uh, very famous, very world-renowned. And he was asked on one occasion, what is the most difficult instrument to play? Here's his response. He said, second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find one who plays second fiddle with as much enthusiasm or second French horn or second flute now that's a problem. And yet, if no one plays second, we have no harmony. <laughs> In our culture, it's not a surprise to you that we have an increasing problem of people who are not willing to be second. They are number one. Maybe it started when Burger King said, have it your way, or, uh, or others kept saying, you know, you're number one, don't settle for less. But um, I saw this once and I thought, well, what a great pyramid this would make. It's the modern monument. I, me, mine, myself. Uh, I've seen some people say they took the word mine out of there and said that I, me, and myself are the modern day trinity for people. Um, you know, it's just a very sad commentary 
on how the people are more interested in caring for themselves than they are in showing care for others. And I know you're this way too, but we're all kind of just up to here with selfishness. It's just gone way overboard. Jesus says that we are to be a servant and to give to others. We are to be different than what everybody else is. That's what he did. That's how he lived his life when he was here. Um, there's no end to a need for serving. There's lots of places for you and I to find where we can help others and encourage others and serve others. True servants are always in demand. Some are seen, some are not. Uh, in the Christian realm, we have people who serve within the church and hopefully we have a lot of people who serve within the community. And, and as I look out, I know there's a lot of you who serve in the community and that's a great thing. And some of the times when you're serving in the church or serving in a community, you're in front of people, people know it, they know what you're doing, they see how that's going. There's also times when you can do things in the church or in the community that are behind the scene that nobody even knows what's going on, um, but you do. You know you have that opportunity to honor God and serve him that way. In your bulletin, for those of you who have one, I listed a whole bunch of Bible verses with the idea that later on today, maybe before kickoff or at halftime or whatever, you can read some of those and just see what it says about serving. There's a couple traits that uh, I found to be true in, in servants, and there's a lot more than just this, but two that I wanted to mention were the area of giving and forgiving. Uh, they're pretty important. A servant does both of those. Both of those are important in their life, giving and um, for giving. But the area of giving, I've read this before, but I saw it again recently, a story that came from World War II. Um, in the early days of World War II, when Germany was just bombing like crazy um, England, and particularly London, and there was an American soldier who was serving there, and he was in his Jeep, and he was driving through some of the devastated area of London, and his you know, managing and manipulating his Jeep down, down the streets, just surveying the damage that was done. And he went down one street that apparently had, at least at one time, had some businesses on this one street. So it was like a downtown kind of thing. And as he was driving down, he noticed a, a very young boy just standing there. It's early morning. He's just standing there staring inside this one picture window uh, at what was going on. And as he drove up, he decided to get out and check on the kid. And so he went over to him and he saw that what he was looking at was a bakery. And so he said to the young boy, son, would you like some of those? As he was looking at some of the pastries that were inside, the boy was startled and just kind of looked at him for a second. And I don't know that he said anything verbally, but he nodded his head, yes. And so the soldier went into the store and he bought some, he came out a couple minutes later with a bag of some fresh donuts and pastry and he handed them to the boy and as he started to walk away the boy said this mister are you god of course of course he would have thought that we're never more like god than when we're giving and when we're good and serving to other people john 3:16 says that god gave God gave his son for us, to serve for us. It was motivated because he loved in such a manner us that he gave his son to die for us. And all we are expected to do is to believe. Just believe and have faith and trust in him. So a great thing that servants do is they give. But they also forgive I know some of you know that this is probably my second favorite verse in scripture, or I don't know if I like the word favorite, but uh, I mean, God thinks it's really nice of me that I approve of his scripture once in a while. So um, here's what Ephesians says, what Paul wrote. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. 
Three things that were to be kind, compassionate, forgiving. Those are what he's asked us to do. If, if you want to change the word compassionate, I, I like the word sensitive better, sensitive to other people. So being kind, being sensitive or compassionate and forgiving of others. This uh, last year, I've been able to do something that I really don't remember ever doing much of before. Uh, there's this thing called the pandemic, and so things have changed a lot. And I've been home on occasion to watch the evening news, um, whether it's ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, whatever, they're all pretty much the same. And I noticed a trend that on their news broadcast, which are usually 30 minutes long, there's 27 minutes that features a lot of violence, hatred, and selfishness. But just for you and I, they throw in three minutes of kindness and compassion at the end of the show. And those are really good things, and I'm glad they do that. But uh, I'm really looking forward to the day when maybe we have 27 minutes of compassion and kindness and just three minutes of, oh, this person has problems. That would be really nice if that were to happen. Forgiveness. That's a hard thing for us to do. It's really probably one of the hardest things we do in our, in our lives. But you and I forgive because Christ forgave us. And when someone says, but you don't know what they did to me. It's terrible what they did. I, I have every right to be angry and hateful toward them. And then the answer to that is, well, what have you done? And what has Christ forgiven you of? I think it's everything, everything. So we're asked, because he's done that for us, we're asked to do that for others as well. God's forgiveness of us makes it possible for us to forgive other people as well. I'm not gonna to turn to it, but in Matthew chapter 18, you're familiar with it. It's an interesting encounter where Peter asked Jesus uh, well, Jesus asked them, how many times are you supposed to forgive? How, do you, how often do you forgive? And Peter says seven times. Uh, is it okay to forgive somebody seven times? And by the way, uh, the Pharisees of their day pretty much had a rule of you forgive three times. After that, you know, give up on the person. And Peter was going over and beyond when he suggested seven times. But you remember Jesus' answer, and it depends on how it's interpreted. But basically, it's something like 70 times 7 or, or whatever. It, I don't think Jesus was saying, now keep track. And on 491, don't forgive them. Stop at that point. I don't think he was doing that. Jesus was saying that our forgiveness should be limitless for other people. Servants need to be big people. Big enough to go on no matter what else happens. Big enough to give and big enough to forgive and never give up. Sam read to us Matthew chapter 20 and uh, in there there's a clamoring going on between a mother and her son's servants of Jesus, apostles, followers about who's going to be the greatest and, um, and I can't blame her for wanting that for her kids but so does every mother want that. And, and Jesus tells about, you know, the authorities in this world do that. They, they just uh, become selfish. They become abusive. They're, they're taking all the authority to themselves. But it's not so with you. That, that phrase there really hits me. Not so with you. That's not the way you and I live our lives. And he says, if you want to be great, you got to be a servant. If you want to be first, you need to be a slave. And you need to... Uh, give to others. Followers of Jesus are different. That's just the way it is. We are different. We take up our cross and we persevere. And the example that we have, obviously, is our Lord Jesus himself. But here's what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2. It says this, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. 
And then it goes on to say in verse 5, your attitude should be the same as, as that of Christ Jesus. And in that great passage, it talks about what Jesus set aside as God to come here and to minister to us, to serve us, to give his life for us. That's what we have. We have a pattern in our Savior that we're to follow, that we are to be servants of each other as well as servants of the Lord. So I have some verses that I want to share with you about just uh, making everything and anything come together for serving our Lord. Um, these are some of my favorite ones. I use these often as well. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. I started asking myself, why do people serve? Why? I mean, there's a lot of positions of service, and why do they do that? Um, some of the big political positions are positions of service, and why do they serve? Well, some want those big three, the power, prestige, and possessions. People will do anything to be powerful or to be important and impressive or even to have lots of stuff. They'll do anything to do that. And, and there's an awful lot of that in our world. We can see that all around us in the corporate worlds, in the political world, in the athletic world. There's a lot of people that that's all their orientation is. But I like to think not everybody's that way. Some people like to just do something that they think is good or maybe they will feel good about themselves if they do some of these. But I'm just gonna suggest that those are good, okay reasons, but the motivation that's best for you and I is to do it to bring glory to Christ, to do it to honor him and to serve him. Yesterday we were listening to Michael Randalek, Dr. Michael Randalek, he does that call-in show, uh, and somebody was asking him questions about prophecy and things, and he started to come up with a phrase. He said, oh, we used to do this phrase, and he tried to say it, and he couldn't come up with it. And he said, oh, I'll have to Google that later. And I turned to Ann and I said, isn't it this what he's trying to say? And I think she agreed with me, but it really does fit here with the servant. Here's what the phrase was that we used to say. Some of you will remember it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that's true when we look at servants. Um, only what's done in the name, to the glory, to the honor of Jesus Christ is going to be what lasts. But you know, the, uh, the thing that I haven't said specifically out loud is but you have to know Christ as your savior to even have that motivation, to be someone who can serve in this way. Uh, you need to know Christ, that he died for your sins, that he paid for that, that he welcomes you by just trusting him and believing in him. Another verse would be from Colossians, Paul wrote in chapter three, and whatever you do, whether it's in word or deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything you do should be done to the glory of Christ, whether you're <coughs> speaking or whether you're acting, doing things, it all should be to the glory of God. He also says a little bit later in verse 23 of Colossians 3, <coughs> whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. We should do everything that we do, all our hearts with great enthusiasm. We should be doing it for the Lord. And he mentions in there that there is a reward that comes. <clears throat> We're gonna probably talk a little bit more about that next Sunday. So as we go to stewards, it's sort of like part two of this message. But there is a reward that comes, and that, um, <clears throat> that reward is done solely for the purpose, for the glory of Christ. That's why we do what we do. 
Christians are to be servants, both of God and of people. And there will be rewards at the end, but that even those are gonna be for Christ. So the bottom line question that you wanna ask is, what are you becoming now that you're grown? <laughs> Who and what are you and what do you want to be in serving the Lord Jesus Christ? So let's pray together. Lord, I do give you thanks for just the uh, example of life that Jesus, you lived for us to show us the, a heart of servanthood. Um, but even beyond that, just to show us the depth of love and how deep it is that you loved us so, so sincerely and so strongly that you gave your life for us to pay for our sins and to give us hope in this life and hope of eternal life. Lord, help us to live lives that just reflect your honor and your glory. Help us to do what is great in serving you and in serving uh, others as well. And may that be very pleasing in your sight and bring you the glory. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. If you have questions or would like to know more about our church, please visit www.ritmangrace.org or email us at ritmangbc at aol.com.